Great, thank you. Thank you. Oh. Hey, that's okay. if we could have that effect on the entire time, I think it'd be great. Look at how fresh-faced I look. My goodness, I've been working. That, that was taken like a hundred years ago, and um, I, I, I feel like I feel like I'm so much older now. Um, hi, how are you? Uh, thank you so much for, for having, having me here. Uh, this is really an honor to, to be speaking about libraries to a group that I usually don't speak about libraries to. I'm, I'm typically talking about uh, uh, doing presentations like this for a group of, uh, of library folks who I'm trying to convince or inspire to be a little more thoughtful about how they um, they, they build programs for their communities, how, how they can be more responsive to, uh, to um, very acute community need. And they sort of know where I'm coming from, even though they, they might not agree with me. Um, they, they certainly know where I'm coming from. So I'm not going to make any assumptions about what your knowledge is of public libraries here. So I'm going to treat this sort of like if I were in front of like an assembly at, a, at an elementary school. So typically what I would do is say, uh, who here, by a show of hands, has a library card? That's great. <laughs> That's awesome. Great. Um, so how many of you have um, been to a public library in the last couple of weeks? It's even better. Great. Great. Um, so what do you use the public library, library for, just out of curiosity? Anybody? Do you, I'm sorry? Free Wi-Fi, okay. Uh, free free Wi-Fi, great. Anybody else? Research at a, at a public library, yeah. Yeah, it's your collection. Okay, so you're talking about the you, yeah you go into like the Forty Second Street Library. That's yeah. great. Okay. Hey, anybody else? Books. Books, okay. <laughs> great. Yeah. Okay, great. And and this is just a question about uh, probably what we're going to be talking about a little bit today about values in in public libraries and public library spaces. I, I'm again I'm curious to know sort of how do you think that public libraries are are relevant? Yes. 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 Why? Well, uh, you can say no too. I, I, I'm, it's it's totally fine. But um, but uh, so so why are public libraries relevant to to communities? Yeah. Well, for me, because last week Marvin needed help with um, his Kindle, and so he's an older gentleman that lives on the Upper East Side, and I was there to volunteer to help him learn how to use his Kindle and download library books. So for him, it was to have the resources of other people to help him do things. And otherwise, like Marvin would might not kind of know what to do with his with his Kindle. Okay, great. So more from Marvin, like Marvin really finds value in the public library. I mean, I do too. <laughs> I shouldn't have said it like that. No, 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 it's good. It's <laughs> yeah, all good, yeah. Too. I just, the last interaction I had with the public library was volunteering. Yeah. To help um, older adults. Okay, great. Great, okay. So it's a place for older adults. It's a place where you can volunteer and do some community service there too. Um, anybody else? Why is the library relevant? Um, I think these days, if you don't have access to um, information and technology and the internet and things like that, that you are effectively locked out of many of the most powerful elements of where the economy is in this setting. And so in terms of economically empowering communities who might not have access to those things at home, um, the library can be a pretty critical, like a pretty critical spot for them. Okay. Access those services and learn about those services. Okay, great. So I hear a lot about access to resources and services for people who might not always otherwise have, have that access. Okay, great. Anybody else? Yeah. I think it's just, in general, better for mental health to actually go into space with, like, physical things you could access and things that you can't do with physical things. You should be a librarian. You're talking like a librarian right there. Like yeah. having these spaces, right, where you can flip through physical objects. Um, even like the smells are important of old books for people, um, me in particular. Yeah. yeah. Um, for my person, uh, opinion, I think uh, knowledge is a shared value in the community. And uh, libraries are making uh, this value reachable for most of the people. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I heard a lot about um, access, affordability for people, um, 
you know, creating these, these spaces for resource sharing for people who might not otherwise have the ability to, to do that in, in public libraries. And I, I think about this a lot, like my work in, work in public libraries, like what, um, sort of what it means to be a librarian, um, what is our role. Uh, I, I think about it pretty, pretty often, and I feel like there are a couple of parts of like a, like a public library's personality, and one, um, you know, certainly has like this sort of social justice, sort of access, inclusion, diversity kind of kind of thread. Um, you know, work that I've been involved in for um, almost my entire career in in libraries. We we value diversity. We value um, like providing access to spaces and resources for people. Um, uh, and and I mean, we give books away for free on the promise that people are going to give them back. Right. I mean, that's a that's a pretty different kind of way to run a business, right? It's something completely different. Um, we, we value reaching out to older adults who um, might not otherwise have that, let alone the, that, that opportunity to learn a new skill, but just as social interaction with somebody who's volunteering with them, right? So it combats some, somewhat of like a social isolation. So we reach out to people who are increasingly marginalized in their communities. And then there's this other sort of strand of our personality that has a, a lot to do with preservation, right, and archives and, and rare books. And we get into relationship ending uh, kind of battles over how to classify certain subject, uh, subjects and, and, and books, um, which has a lot more order than the other part of our personality. But they're not, they, they, can, they can exist in the same space. And that's what I find so, like, so exciting about being in a, in, in a public library setting, particularly in, in the borough of Brooklyn. Um, so thank you for for um, for indulging me in 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 that. Um, it, so I was speaking with my wife uh, last night about the talk uh, that that we're going to have today, and we sort of discovered that there were a couple of themes that were going to emerge as we talk about public libraries, and um, it, which might be helpful for for you folks as you're as you're sitting here in this discussion and. Um, one, it's really about library values. What's the role of a public library, particularly today in, in, in this country? Um, two, uh, I think, again, might be relevant to, to you folks, like how do small groups of individuals within a larger organization affect change within that organization and ultimately sort of guide the direction of that large organization? And, uh, and three, Three, in particular, in the work that we've been doing in um, jails and prisons, is what my wife likes to call the sinister compromise. How do we hold and retain our values as an institution that values in inclusion and diversity and access? How do we retain those values when we're working in a, quite frankly, we're working in a jail that, um, by by all measures, does not value inclusion, access, and and diversity? Are you giving something up for people to open up the door for you to access these populations? And that's something that I think about daily in, in my job. So those three things I think we can we sort of think about as we talk about public libraries in this space. And I'll try to do this as conversationally as I can. So if you'd like to ask questions while I'm talking, that, that, would, be, that would be fine. Um, I'll, I'll try to go over sort of public libraries in general. Um, talk about my work specifically in Brooklyn and uh, maybe go through a little bit of the, the background, um, my own background that brought me into, into public libraries. Okay. So um, starting off with a little bit of controversy, the, America, the American Library Association is the governing body of um, uh, libraries across the country. It's the largest um, professional association for libraries in the world. It has a membership of roughly 62,000 um, of its members. Uh, it is an association that really does a lot of the lobbying uh, for us in Washington. It secures funding for us. It um, advocates for priorities in, in libraries um, that relate to copyright, net neutrality, um, uh, uh, very famously sort of um, advocating for or um, fighting against uh, provisions in the Patriot Act. Um, and it also uh, released a statement after the presidential election in, in November. Uh, so a week after uh, the, the election in November, uh, the American Library Association sent out a, a press release that reads in part, ALA offers its expertise and resources to the incoming administration and the new and returning members of Congress from all parties elected on November 8th. 
quote, the American Library Association is dedicated to helping all of our nation's elected leaders identify solutions to the challenges our country faces. ALA President Julie Todaro said, we are ready to work with President-elect Trump, his transition team, incoming administration, and members of Congress to bring more economic opportunity to all Americans and advance other goals that we have in common. And these transition sort of press releases and in, in a, a turnover of power are not un, uncommon. Um, it, it, although it triggered something in the ALA membership, a membership in ALA that's usually pretty passive, like ALA, American Library Association membership sort of like hangs out in the background of, of membership's minds. Um, but ALA membership basically lost their minds over this. This is the first comment that came up after the press release was, um, uh, was, was released to, to the public. Um, the idea here is what other goals do we have in common with the administration that's coming in? And is not the administration's goals and priorities a direct affront to the values and principles of librarianship that we had just discussed? So yes, we lost our minds, which is actually quite refreshing because it is a very passive organization or an association. So having people come out and, uh, and actually speak out against the, uh, the leadership of the American Library Association was actually quite, um, was quite, uh, was quite refreshing. So if you're, if you're interested, actually I had um, the in, in the press release, the, uh, it, it goes on to say that those common goals um, that they're trying to, like ALA is trying to align their priorities with, with the Trump administration, revolve around uh, three sort of central, central goals. One is to serve uh, returning veterans uh, better in, public libra in, in libraries across the country. One is to allocate more resources to small business and entrepreneurship. And the third, um, very uncontroversial, um, uh, priority for the American Library Association is to advocate for greater broadband access um, across libraries in, in the country. Um, so stepping a, a little bit a little bit closer to home, I'll talk about the work that we do in 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 Brooklyn, um, and maybe just go over sort of like what brought me into libraries uh, in in the first place. Um, I started in libraries about 11 years ago. Um, I was going to uh, actually, I was on my way to become a, a teacher. Um, I thought about public libraries because I was reintroduced to public libraries. Um, my daughter was, was born 11, 11 years ago and I started to use the library a little bit, a little bit more. Um, and I recall like, going into the Central Library in Brooklyn. Does anybody know where the Central Library in Brooklyn, have you been to the, the Brooklyn Public Library? It's on Grand Army Plaza. The, book, uh, the, the library itself sits at the corner of Flatbush and Eastern Parkway. And the design of the, the library is it's quite remarkable. It's, it's shaped, actually it's shaped like an open book. So you walk in up these stairs into the spine of the book and the leaves of the book go up Flatbush and one of the leaves goes up um, Eastern, Par Eastern Parkway, excuse me. And it's just an inspiring kind of place to, to go to work every day. Um, back then, I, of course, I wasn't, um, I wasn't going to work. I was taking my daughter in for, for a story time. And on the side of the building is chiseled in the side, among other quotations, um, it's a quotation, here are enshrined the longings of great hearts. I'm dragging a stroller up these steps into the library and I'm reading this and I walk into this giant space and there's these, into this grand lobby and these enormous, enormously high ceilings and it's like a, an 11 o'clock on a Wednesday morning and it's packed and there are so many people in this, in this space and we started to hear all these different languages that were being spoken. We saw or I was looking, I observed there were so many different, um, different age groups that were kind of walking around, um, all different backgrounds. There were people who were sleeping on, uh, on the tables, clearly trying to get out of like the, the bad weather, just to, to use that space to, to, to get shelter. And it was really inspiring. And I thought that this was a place where I'd like to, uh, like to spend, my, spend my time. Um, so I applied to library school, there's a program that Pratt had in partnership with the Brooklyn Public Library, they would uh, send me to, to library school at Pratt and I would get a full-time trainee job, librarian trainee job at the Brooklyn Public Library. 
Um, it was funded by the Institute of Museum and Library Services. Incidentally, one of those um, arts uh, organizations um, uh, that I in the administration's proposed budget is, is to be eliminated um, completely <laughs> out, of the, out of the federal budget. Uh, so IMLS. Um, so my, my first experience is, as you saw in the video, and thank you for, for bringing up that, that, that video. I don't know where you guys found it. Um, <laughs> great. Uh, but my, my, first, my first library job was in, was in Brownsville, Brooklyn. Um, the idea for this trainee program was that I would spend about three months in, in one site, and then I would rotate to a different neighborhood. And at that point, I had been living in Brooklyn for about seven years eight years at that point. Um, started to raise a family there. Um, I knew only like the two neighborhoods that I'd ever lived in in Brooklyn, basically. I mean, we're in a very large city and it's very diverse, but we can also be very provincial at times. Like I didn't really need to go outside the boundaries of my neighborhood to get anything, really. Least of which in Brownsville, Brooklyn. I didn't really have any reason to go out there. Um, and then one day I found myself working out there full time. And Brownsville, Brooklyn, and Carmen on, on my way in today said that some of you had done a project or an observation project or something out in Brownsville. I guess I was probably kind of in, in your shoes too if it was your first time being out to Brownsville. I observed a lot. I was sitting behind a reference desk. I would meet people as they came through the door. Um, we were situated, the Brownsville Library is situated among um, some of the highest concentration of public housing in the nation. Um, there are certainly a lot of stories that I heard about Brownsville when I went in there um, and after talking with some of the community members who came to the library, I found that they were pretty resentful of some of the stories that, that they, they were hearing about Brownsville because they didn't really have a voice in telling those stories. I met a lot of people who were very proud of the neighborhood, proud of the history of the neighborhood, lifelong residents of Brownsville, Brooklyn, who would um, do anything for their, for their neighbors in their neighborhood. My conception of public libraries really changed. I wanted to be a librarian, essentially, as you saw in the video, to, to work with rare books. Um, I took a class in, in library school where I actually was able to touch a Gutenberg Bible. I was working in, um, this, uh, in the rare books division, taking a class in the rare books division at the New York Public Library. And, and New York Public Library has one, they have a copy of the Gutenberg Bible, and there are only like 48 copies of this thing in, on the planet. And they have one of them. And my instructor, Michael Inman, took the Gutenberg Bible out and had it on display. We had all check our bags. My class had to check our bags at the door. We had to wash our hands. And we lined up to go and touch the Gutenberg Bible. <laughs> and it was like I was looking forward to saying it was like a transcendent experience. It was like I was in communion with one of the top two or three important things that happened to this world in the past 1,000 years. So it was my turn. and I had like two seconds to touch the Gutenberg Bible and I, like that. <laughs> and I called my mom afterwards and I was like, oh, <laughs> Mom, I, I got to touch the Gutenberg Bible. This is like, it was, so, it was so exciting for me. Of course, my mom was like, so does that mean you're going back to church? She was like talking about like going back to church. She thought that I was going to go <laughs> to mass and um, but she didn't get it. But uh, it's a side story, but back in Brownsville, there's no Gutenberg Bible, right? And, but I found there was something much more special and important um, out in Brownsville. There was a sense of community. Like, we would have kids come into the library, and we got to know them so well. We just, like, watched them all day. Like, we got to, we were, like, looking out for those kids. And they would come in because we were the only ones in the neighborhood who would sort of, like, open up the doors for them and let them, let them play. Um, we had philosophy groups. People would come in and talk about philosophy. They'd talk about Kant, and they would talk about um, Wittgenstein. It was great. Um, and uh, and as, as you saw in the video, too, um, there, there was one woman who came in, and she was looking for, for her son. And, and that's sort of how I got clued into some of the very unique needs in, in, in neighborhoods across Brooklyn. And I felt like that all the things that I was doing as a librarian in, in a public library, like my role was going to be constantly changing. I was going to be elbow deep in like eight year olds doing the hokey pokey one minute. And then I was also going to be talking, bragging about touching the Gutenberg Bible to somebody the next. And um, that was very exciting for me as a career choice. So um, I knew that I was in, in, in the right spot. Um, after the Brownsville experience, I rotated around to a bunch of different branches in different divisions in the library. I drove the kids' mobile, which is like a bookmobile. 
um, drove it around Brooklyn to different parks and um, schools, uh, mostly schools that served uh, children who have special needs. Um, and uh, I worked in the Brooklyn Archive, um, the Brooklyn Collection. Uh, we did a veterans oral history project with the Library of Congress out of that site. Um, I was in charge of the volunteer resources uh, folks. Um, I was a job search librarian for a while. And, um, and then I, I met my predecessor, who would be my predecessor um, at the New York Public Library, who was running a jail library program. He was at a meeting, um, his name is Jim Huffman. Um, I got to talking with him and he said that he, his job was uh, to go out to Rikers Island and push around book carts to deliver books to, to people who, who are incarcerated. And I immediately thought that that was a, a wonderful way or a wonderful expression of what a public library can do, to go into a place that um, has severe restrictions on access to information and then every day figure out a way to carve out more space for people to access that information. And again, you were talking about access. Um, resources. I mean, I thought that was really, uh, really something that I wanted to learn a little bit more about. So um, I started volunteering with, with Jim and his team. Um, and then uh, shortly thereafter, about a year after I met Jim and I started working with him, he retired. And then New York Public Library asked me to go over and lead the jail and prison program at New York Public Library, which I did for about four years. Um, until Brooklyn Public Library called me back and wanted me to establish an outreach services department, and that's where we are right now. So the outreach services department, we're up to um, up to uh, present time. Um, the outreach services department started uh, three and a half years ago. Um, the Revson Foundation, Charles H. Revson Foundation, funded the Brooklyn Public Library to uh, find out a way to. Um, develop programs for people who find themselves increasingly marginalized in our communities. Um, they did a community needs assessment um, that lasted about a year uh, in Brooklyn to find out, to survey residents of Brooklyn, to survey staff on what the, the needs were in their, in their libraries. And one of the, the needs that came up was um, much greater attention uh, on inclusion and, and access. To, to services for people, again, who are increasingly marginalized. Um, so when I got, to, got back to Brooklyn about three and a half years ago, um, we decided to figure out a way to divide our work into the four principal areas. Um, one is uh, older adult services. So currently at the Brooklyn Public Library, we um, prioritize services for homebound seniors. Um, but we do a whole lot of work with seniors who are coming into our branches. Um, older adults are the fastest growing demographic, not only in Brooklyn or in New York City, but across the country. Um, in Brooklyn in particular, with such a diverse group of people, um, the foreign born older adult population is growing at a faster rate than, than any, other, any other group um, in, in Brooklyn. So we wanted to make sure that we were um, ready to serve, serve those folks. So we, we operate, just principally, we operate a books by mail program. So people can sign up to get um, books sent to their house for free. Um, and it's one of those things that, you know, books are one thing. I mean, you get your John Grisham novel, that's great. But what oftentimes what happens is people will call our office and they'll talk to Judy, who handles all the calls. And then they'll just talk to Judy for about an hour. And Judy realizes that this is just as important as getting a book, that sometimes the phone call to Judy from some of our older adults who are homebound might be the only conversation, like substantial conversation that, that they're going to have all, all week. So Judy just lets it happen. So it's also a service that way um, to combat social isolation. Um, we do run a, an oral history project for older adults called Our Streets, Our Stories. Um, we I've been doing this now for about two years, two and a half years, where we um, interview older adults who've been living in Brooklyn, particularly in neighborhoods they've lived in their entire lives, and talk to them about what's important to them, um, sort of how the neighborhood's changed over time, to give them the space to talk about their stories and their experiences, uh, and, and interview them um, ab about, about what Brooklyn um, was to them uh, uh, in, in, in their youth. And it's mostly a, a a service that again exists just like that phone call to Judy. It's ma it's a matter of like giving people the the space to tell their stories and to be listened to. Um, 
And we also do uh, sequential arts-based uh, classes for older adults. So we um, bring in teaching artists to, um, uh, to our branches, and we invite older adults in to take a 10-week class on water painting or sculpture or storytelling. And the idea is to get, again, combat social isolation and bring people more into, into the public space and to create community with one another. Um, our immigrant services program has been getting a lot of attention lately. Um, at first, about three years ago, when we were designing it, we thought that we would be focused on language access, again, addressing um, language needs in our diverse uh, communities in Brooklyn. Um, and we wanted to prioritize um, access to citizenship, which we also knew was a, um, which was a, a great need for, for communities. So we built in a, um, with a grant from the United States Citizenship and Immigration Services, we, we, we built in uh, citizenship access classes for, for folks in, in Brooklyn. Um, and we also brought on immigration attorneys um, to help people, multilingual immigration attorneys, to meet with people one-on-one -on -one to go over their citizenship um, uh, needs or any other legal services that they, that they, that they have. Um, and also immigrant services have been quite responsive lately. Um, they've been very busy uh, trying to figure out how we can prepare people and sort of um, kind of ease some people's fear uh, that they might be feeling right now in, in this climate. So we've been doing a lot of um, sort of pop-up know your rights and responsibilities workshops for people in multiple languages across the borough. Um, we're also working with the Attorney General's office now to figure out sort of how public libraries or public spaces in general can be considered safe spaces. I mean, about a year ago, we would get up in front of people and we'd say, you know, we invite everybody into our libraries, we're inclusive, we're diverse, and everybody should feel safe to come into our programs in the public library. That, that line of communication just means something entirely different right now. We just need to be careful and, and try to figure out like how we communicate that with our public. Um, and we're also looking to, uh, to work with people who are experiencing homelessness. So last year we were fortunate, we, we brought on a social worker to work with us full time to, um, uh, to, to meet with people who may be experiencing homelessness in, in our branches. So it's a departure from what we typically do in public libraries. Um, but there are people who are accessing our branches who, who need more acute services. So we're bringing on a social worker who, um, whose principal aim is to make sure that people can find permanent housing um, uh, while they're, while they're in, our, in our sites. Um, and the jail and prison work, um, we, can, we can sort of, we can go into, into the jail and prison work. I think we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that, that today. Um, so the first thing to, to talk about when we're talking about people who are in jail and prison is, in this country is that we incarcerate an enormous amount of people here in the United States. Um, we incarcerate 2.3 million people in, uh, in the United States. Um, Houston, Texas has a population of 2.1 million people. Chicago has a population of about 2.7 million people. So right in the middle of the third and fourth most populous cities in, in, in this country is this population whose common identity is wrapped up in their, in their contact with the criminal justice system. We, the United States has a population that represents 4.4% of the world's population, but we represent, we have about a quarter of all of the prisoners in, in the world incarcerated in the, in the United States. That's a, that's a shocking, that's a shocking number of of, of people. Um, so it, the criminal justice system doesn't just affect uh, the individuals who are sitting in prisons and jails. Um, they also have families, there are whole communities that are affected negatively by the criminal justice system. In New York State, um, it's estimated that there are 54,000 children who have an incarcerated parent um, who's either in prison or, or jail. Um, Across the United States, there are 2.7 million children who have a parent who is incarcerated in a prison or a jail. So how does the library sort of address this particular concern, right? So um, I'm just going to go over some of these, um, these photographs of some of the programs that we run. So this is the Lopez family. Uh, we 
run this program called Daddy and Me at the, at the city jail. So we work primarily at Rikers Island. Um, we're always trying to figure out how we can connect families a little bit better together, um, despite their, the fact of their incarceration. So this was at a Daddy and Me program. It's like a culminating event after a series of four workshops that we, that we run with the fathers um, who are there. So we get together a group of about 10 to 15 fathers who, who are in jail. Um, they, they go through a series of workshops where we, we have them talk about their children. We have them talk about what it means to be a, a father. Um, we identify each other as parents rather than as people who are incarcerated or any other, identif uh, any other identifier. And then we bring in librarians to talk to them about what their young children are going through in terms of like uh, learning how to read and write before they actually know how to read and write. So sort of um, you know, talking to them about vocabulary development and storytelling ability, like narrative skills, phonological awareness, sort of like what sounds good uh, to children, how to sing songs with your children. Um, you know, how to tell stories by just like walking down the street and pointing, pointing out signs, um, but really getting them focused on uh, their, their children and what it means to be a parent and what it means to be a very important um, uh, first teacher uh, to, to their children, even when they're apart. Um, we bring in a bunch of children's books and we talk to the fathers about what they might like to read to their children and they choose a handful of books. Um, they inscribe little messages in the books too, write out original poetry, uh, that sort of thing. And we bring in audio recorders and, uh, and if they choose, they'll, be able, they'll, they'll just read, record themselves reading books to, to their, their kids. And then on the, um, on the final day, we um, invite the, the kids in to get library cards, to get uh, all the books and the recordings, and they have cake and they get to read books with their, with their parents. Um, so these are, these are, these are chilled. These are one of the 2.7 million kids. So we also, um, outside of the Daddy Me program, we also spend a lot of time at the jails. Um, we're typically at a New York City jail, uh, at least one day out of, out of the week. Um, this is Nick Franklin. He looks like a super guy. On that picture, he's standing at the foot of the bridge that goes uh, that connects Queens to Rikers Island. This Rikers Island is um, about 420 acres um, of mostly landfill that sits like right next to LaGuardia Airport. It's connected to Queens by a bridge. Um, it's technically, as far as the U.S. Census is, con is concerned, a part of part of the Bronx. Um, but you go through Queens to get there. This is Nick. Um, uh, moments before somebody from the van shouted at us to get out of there. Um, getting his picture taken. Nick is one of our um, central jail librarians. And um, so what happens every week we go out, we have jail operation, jail library operations out of seven jails. Um, there are 10 jails on Rikers Island, one hospital. Um, there are also a couple of jails in the borough. There's one in Brooklyn, and there's one in the Bronx. Um, so our libraries look a little bit different at each facility. So uh, oftentimes they're on a cart and we roll around the book carts to different housing areas, just like you'd see in, in, in movies, really. Um, and some are standing libraries. We'll be able to carve out some real estate inside the jails for people to come into a library space to check out books and discuss what they like to read. Um, Sometimes it's uh, some of these books. I don't know why I got these. Okay, so th uh, I put these up here actually because uh, we were we were we were in one of the the adolescent facilities. Um, there's so New York City, New York State uh, will um, incarcerate and hold uh, young people as as young as 16 years old. Um, and w there's an adolescent facility that we work at at Rikers Island. Um, uh, 16, 17, and 18 year old boys. And we were cleaning out a library space and we had about two dozen copies of each of these titles that just somehow met, like found, them, found their way into, into the space. And the, um, it's terribly difficult to b get books inside, inside a jail and to wander upon these. Somebody, somebody thought these would be good, this would be good reading material for 16, 17, and 18 year old boys. Maybe, maybe they were, but we, we got rid of them. Um, we also run a, as, as was mentioned in the video, we run a video visitation service for, um, for families. Um, this is called Telestory. Uh, we started this program about three years ago um, as a pilot. 
Cisco uh, donated a, a machine for us to use, um, a video, video machine to use, and um, we set it up in, in our uh, central library branch. And the idea is that like once we have like a daddy me program with a family and uh, we have our, our family day and everybody says goodbye, it's very difficult for us to keep in contact with the families. And what we really want to do is create a um, kind of a bridge back into the community through a public space like a library. But people's lives are really chaotic. Um, it's really difficult to, um, to maintain uh, that connection with, with family members. So we were looking, away, looking for a way to um, increase our programming for families inside our, inside our libraries. So um, we knew, yeah. Every, every family is different. I mean, we, um, we require anybody to use the service. I mean, we, we require that their, their children know where dad's at or where mom's at, so there's no surprises. So if a kid comes in, he's not gonna get surprised that there's you know, dad sitting on the other end of the video screen. So they need to be aware of the situation, right? Um, but some people, yes. I mean, some people will tell their children if they're incarcerated that they're, that they're they're away at school. Or they're you know they're, they have a job somewhere out of state. So, so it varies by family to family. But in order for, for people to use the service, that they're they're um, they need to know. And as you can see from our marketing of the green bears that we that we uh, chose for this, we market this as a children's program, a family program, right? There's no. Um, there's none of that, right? There's none of that. It's a, ch it's a family program where children can read books with their, with their parents, right? Just the same way that I can bring my kids into a public library and read to them when I'm out of work. Like, a kid can go into a library and read books with his dad. It just has that same feel. And if we do our job right, then the technology that's using to facilitate that will disappear a little bit, and we've seen that happen. Um, so, so how this how this works, um, and, and you got to some of this, right? So we meet somebody at the um, at the jail primarily. Um, they might go through a Daddy Me program or an early literacy program, um, or we might see somebody on a book cart and get to know them. And uh, we just ask them if they'd like to stay like stay in contact with their children a little bit more. Um, and we invite them in for, for a televisit. We make sure that um, the caregiver is, uh, is okay with that. Like we, we make sure that there's no orders of protection against anybody. Um, uh, and um, we certainly make sure that the, the children know that the parent is, is incarcerated. Um, so this is a family program. Um, as you can see, we consciously put these into spaces that are semi-public. Um, so that's a window that overlooks the grand lobby of the library. We didn't want to create a program where we're further sort of stigmatizing or, or, or marginalizing people. We didn't want to like close the door on anybody and put them off into a corner. Um, they're part of our community at the library. Uh, and that was very important for us to make sure that they, they, they had that space they felt connected to the other other programs and services that were going on at the library because it doesn't really matter if your parent is incarcerated it simply doesn't you're coming in to read books with each other um, this was very difficult to set up um, this was a very there's a lot of uh, challenges um, the department of corrections in the city uh, in any city uh, across across the country is notoriously difficult to to change and to add anything new to. Um, this took about five years to, uh, to really get going to where it is today. Um, you know, it started about five years ago when we had the idea. Um, we knew that the Department of Corrections was using video uh, technology for people for video court. They've had this technology that was just sitting there on the island, on Rikers Island, for, for many years. Um, attorneys used the video feed to, to meet with their clients. So we just kept on plugging away and trying to um, pitch the, the, the jails that this idea of allowing us to jump on that video feed to, to facilitate family visitation was a good idea. Um, we also wanted to do it in the right way. Uh, video visitation is a technology or a service that's proliferating across the country. 
by and large by, like, by for-profit companies who are charging families to use the service. Um, and they're also, in many cases, they're cutting contracts with municipalities to prioritize video visitation over in-person visits and sometimes eliminating in-person visitations altogether, which is happening in DC most uh, um, specifically. So what happens in those situations is like you would have to drive to the, the jail in Washington, D.C., and you get out of your car, and then you go into a lobby where there's a bunch of video booths, and then you would sit down at the video booth to visit with your loved one, who is, it could be about 40 feet away in a different room, on a video screen. Um, there, the argument for that is that it's cost savings. You don't have to like, you know, transport anybody around. There's not um, like there's less security that you need to, you know, keep, um, keep track of. Like in a large setting where there's a bunch of people running around, you can't push contraband through a video screen. All of that is garbage, by the way. So um, we don't buy any of that. So the uh, we see public libraries and public institutions as being able to leverage their goodwill and their good name to combat or push back upon the for-profit motives of companies who are trying to take advantage of families uh, in this way. So we rest on three principles with the Telestory program. So it has to be free, totally free. There's no cost to families. It has to be accessible to families. So it needs to be in multiple locations throughout the borough across the city. And uh, it has to work alongside in-person visitations, not as a replacement, but as a complement. So accessibility, um, so we were able to, through a Knight Foundation grant um, that we received last June, we were able to expand to 12, a total of 12 sites. So as you'll see, we have sort of geographic diversity. So there's North Brooklyn, there's South Brooklyn down in Coney Island, um, uh, Bushwick. Um, there are also neighborhoods that have a high concentration of people who are affected by the justice system, quite frankly. So we have um, branches out in East New York and Brownsville, um, uh, Red Hook even. So we want to make sure that people who wanted the service could access the service. And um, yeah, so right now we're up in 12, uh, 12 branches. We also are piloting a program up in the Albany Public Library, up in Albany, New York. Uh, they have one of our video units, so we'll see what this looks like in another city. When we receive the Knight Foundation funding to expand to these 12 branches, the speaker of the city council, um, Melissa Mark Vivaretto, was also, who's also leading the charge on um, the, the campaign to shut down Rikers Island, uh, she had in mind to uh, light up community centers with video visitation technology. And so we met with her, uh, the, uh, the library did, we met with um, uh, the speaker in her office to talk about using uh, public libraries as a space where you, you could expand video visitation. So now we have video units in um, the Manhattan Public Libraries and the Bronx Public Library, Staten Island, and Queens. They all have video visitation units. So again, expanding on this accessibility um, uh, component of the program. Um, we give a lot of uh, training to the branches and tools on like how they can how they can do it, and this is all code for just treat families um, treat families well. Uh, you need to welcome families into your branch and make them feel like they're part of the community and not um, not criminalized in any way, stigmatized in any way. And I also put this up here because Carmen helped design some of this material. Thank you. Um, and also for um, the tools that we um, give people, this is for, uh, for, the, for the families who participate in the televisit program, the Telestory program. So there's a welcome to the library, a lot of the services that we offer, and just how can we help? Um, you know, are you looking for uh, housing referrals, or is there sort of like any, any, anything that you need, there's sort of like a list for it, and people can um, then be referred to some of our community-based partners or internally to uh, Brooklyn Public Library staff. And we've also contracted out with the Osborne Association, which is a uh, sort of a nationally recognized reentry organization that's based in Brooklyn um, to provide social work interns to be on hand at these video visitation sessions. So if children need extra support or families simply need extra support, um, which happens sometimes, um, uh, they can be available uh, to, to step in. We had a, a family not too long ago who came in. Uh, mom brought her daughter in to, uh, to visit with um, dad who was incarcerated at Rikers Island. And mom didn't want anything to do with the visit. She didn't want uh, to, 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 see, to see her daughter's uh, dad. Um, so we called in the Osborne uh, social work 
intern to come in to facilitate the visit. So mom sat outside and, and was on her phone while, while um, her daughter was visiting with, with dad uh, with the social work intern side. I'm going to go over here too. Um, people are using the, um, the services for, for different ways too. So at our new Utrecht location, which is in Bensonhurst, there's a woman who is exclusively using video visitation to, um, to visit with her, with her incarcerated son, who's about 19, 20 years old. And she's doing that um, mostly because uh, she doesn't want to go to Rikers Island because um, uh, she's, she's undocumented and she doesn't want to go in and, and risk like going to an agency where she has to pass off her ID. So she's using the service now like uh, once a week to come in and visit with her son at the library. Um, I put these in here simply because I, I just want um, just to, um, to demonstrate that it's important to pay attention to how we talk about prisons and, and, and prisoners. This is a quotation at the top from Angela Davis who writes, the prison is considered so natural that it is extremely hard to imagine life without it. And I think the answer um, uh, why, why prisons are so, life is, it's hard to um, imagine life without prisons is because we keep on recycling these images of what um, prisons and prisoners are um, all over the place. So you'll see so on the left-hand side, this is a, a recent New York Daily News article um, talking about uh, NYCHA housing and um, you know people who have a, uh, a criminal justice ba like a criminal history um, who are who are coming into into NYCHA housing. Um, clearly, this is meant to um, to to project some sort of negative image about uh, people who are coming home from um, from prison or jail. Um, the right hand side is is another kind of stock uh, kind of kind of photo of uh, people who are supposed to be in prison um, as as Angela Davis says like it's hard for us to imagine that 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 prisons um, aren't aren't natural part of our of our society because we, we can't we can't fathom like if we didn't have prisons, then these folks would be, I guess, like out outside in, in our in our daily lives, which is a dangerous um, position to to have. Um, this is one of our library partners' ads for the televisit uh, service, which we objected to, um, uh, vehemently objected to. Um, we had in mind to strip away the the fact of incarceration and replace it with the fact of parenthood in everything that we were rolling out to the public. That was very important to us. We had a protract protracted battle with another library system who wanted to go a different route. Um, and I do think that this is part of the same, same problem. Um, there's a lot of technical challenges with this, clearly, um, scheduling, coverage, and technology. Um, but in the end, uh, we do have, uh, yeah, so this is basically what, why, why, we, why we do the work, right? So we have a child who's coming in to do a televisit with um, her, her father, and we have these evaluation forms that we give to the families. And for the children, we just have them uh, write a message or draw a picture of their experience with the visit, and uh, this has made her happy and happy and happy and very happy. <laughs> Three years ago, that was our first visit. We were so happy and happy and happy and happy. <laughs> we spent like two years trying to get this thing going. And you can see all the toys we just like threw in there. Like, oh, some of those my kids' toys. We went pretty, pretty wild. Like we had somebody just like just draw a sign, give people 3D glasses. Um, we were just so happy to, uh, to have this actually up and running. And now we're, again, we're in 12 sites now. We're projecting um, that we're going to hit about 600 visits this year uh, for, for televisit, and it keeps, on, it keeps on going up. This week, the reason why I look a lot more tired now than I did in that video that you saw at the front end of this presentation, um, we have, I think, 16 visits scheduled uh, this, this week, and we, we're still getting phone calls. So we are meeting a need with the community, and we're serving it at the public library in a very neutral space, a very welcoming space, and a space where people um, don't feel like they're, being, uh, that they're carrying around any stigma. So. 
I did want to leave some uh, time for for questions. I think that um, we're, we're running out of time. That's what we had prepared for today. So I'd, I'd be happy to take any questions. Yeah. Can you describe the process for the television a little bit? Like um, when a parent, child, and incarcerated parent decide that they want to participate, like how long does it take before they're in front of the screen? Um, we can do it 24 hours in advance now. I mean, it used to take about a week, but we've gotten it down. The process now is, is less, far less complicated. Now that everybody sort of knows what to do. Um, when we first tried our first televisit right here, this was done by fax technology because that's what the Department of Corrections had us running on. And we had to run around the building to find a fax machine to fax over like the clearance forms. But uh, so now we, we've got it down to about 24 hours. And if we, so if we're, you know, if we, we go in and we talk to dad that morning and he says, I want to visit with my kids tomorrow afternoon, we'll, we'll run back to the library, put in the forms uh, as long as before three o'clock and then, and then tomorrow afternoon he'll, he'll be in front of his kid. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so it's a, it's a good question and it makes this a little bit more, um, uh, so there's no regulate, there's no limitation on how many times you can um, visit by, through video. Um, so there is, um, there are severe limitations to how many times you can go in person to Rikers Island, for instance. So um, there are people who go their one visit to Rikers Island for the week in person and then they'll visit like two or three times with us on video. And there's no limitation to it. Um, uh, yeah. Do the kids know that uh, their their father or mothers are in the prison? They before they visit there, we we require that um, they they know, right? We don't want them to be surprised when they come in. So the caregiver um, who's bringing the child in needs to have that discussion with them um, before they they come in for a visit. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I quit my job at the New York Public Library because it was um, partly because it was so difficult to push this program through. So about five years ago, um, there's a psychologist who's from the New York Society for Ethical Culture who spoke to me about the um, possibility of video visitation. He was meeting with patients in upstate nursing homes, like he was he was doing video visitation telepsychology. Um, and he wanted to use this kind of service for people in jail. So we started talking about maybe doing it in libraries. And I, I mentioned this only because it's, it sort of illustrates how far we've come in like five years. But five years ago, I pitched this idea to um, uh, my colleagues at, at the New York Public Library when I was working there. And it was immediately rejected. And the reason for it was they didn't want to have, they weren't comfortable having that interaction with, um, that, that close interaction with the criminal justice system. And it was, it was difficult for me to, to convince them otherwise, right? But once I got into Brooklyn and started talking about it and got the right people to sort of say, oh yeah, yeah, I totally get that. Like it's a, it's a, it's a program about like reading books with your, with your kids, right? And I'm like, yeah, that's totally right, that's it. Like we're bringing people together to read books with their kids. Um, it was a little bit more, e it was easier for me to do it in Brooklyn. And then once it happened, then the then we got a lot of political support, and then we got a lot of funding support. So and, and now we're going to close down Rikers Island apparently. So this is like it's in five years' time, like the whole landscape has changed. Yeah. Um, going back to what you were saying before about combating social isolation, has do you know if this technology has been used for those um, for the older population and how or how we might be able to apply the same model to combating social isolation. Do you mind talking a little bit about yeah. Yeah, so um, the answer is yes. We've been using it with older adult patrons who are homebound. So we're running um, we, we decided to run a, a 1984 book club for 48 months, like uh, every month for 48 months at the library. 
Um, and we've included older adults who are homebound. So we're using this to connect. We have now 10 older adults who are beaming into a, a class together through video, and they're all reading George Orwell over, <laughs> over a series of like four weeks. It's great. Um, and we've also done other discussion groups with older adults. So we, we go to people's homes who are registered with our books by mail service. We have about 300 people, 320 people who are registered. And we've dropped off like MiFi devices and tablets for them. So they're connected in a way that they haven't been before. And like the first one we dropped off, like the, the guy was like looking up like Willie Nelson songs and he was so happy, he was great. But we're, we're connecting him now to a, um, a 1984 book club. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Okay. Sorry. Um, as the, the library's like identity and services change over time, how do you communicate like that evolving identity back to the, back out to the community who might think it's like have an old perception of what the library is? Um, we try to be as inclusive, at um, least in our, in our department, um, we try to be as inclusive with the community um, from the development stage onward, so they, they're not like caught, caught off guard. In Brooklyn, it's different. I mean, every, every neighborhood has its own unique identity, and we're very fiercely loyal to our neighborhoods and our neighborhood identity, so all the needs that are expressed there in those communities are different. So we take great pains to you know, communicate with the, the community to bring them in to help like figure out what are the things that we can do to, to, to meet these needs. So there's very little kind of surprise there. I mean, there are surprises with a program like this. If, if somebody in Borough Park hears about it or reads about it, but it's, you know, at a library over in Red Hook, they might not quite get it or even approve of it. Um, but, yeah. But it's okay. I mean, I'm willing to, to sit down and talk about with anybody, like talk about and communicate the message of a public library that this is, this is part and parcel of what we do, right? So, yeah, we just try to involve the community as much as we can. Yeah. Are you um, measuring this in some way regarding mental health or a, a very little different? system here, but like if they want parole, the behavior, whatnot, like does this fall into that scope? Um, it falls into the scope, and we're trying to figure out the best way to, to measure that. So the Minnesota Department of Corrections had um, studied for, for a while recidivism rates as they're tied to family visitation. So they found that people even who, who get like one visit while they're locked up for a year, like that impacts their recidivism rate, um, just having that connection with people. So we're trying to right now try to ask the right questions for people and not to be too intrusive. And with the public library, just generally speaking, like it's really hard to measure the impact of a public library. Like I think that everybody in this, I know I do, and it, I, like I have pretty good feelings about the public library and my experience at a public library, but I can't quite quantify it, nor can I kind of express it. But we're hoping that like with a program like this, the long-term kind of outcomes will be like this kid who's visiting with his dad like every week um, through video by walking down to his, like a block to his neighborhood library. Like imagine it's like, like 20 years from now, like, hi, like the goodwill that you've like generated with that kid. Like and how do you quantify that? I'm not, I'm not quite sure. Is it through recidivism rates? I mean, that's the, that's the golden ring, right? That's what you're looking for. Like, does this keep people out of jail? Looking for the right questions to ask on that one, right? Yep. You mentioned briefly that when you were trying to figure out what services to prioritize, that you did a year-long needs assessment. What was the what were methods did you use to conduct that needs assessment? Um, I wasn't here for that. It, like, it came like it 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 uh, it produced the department or produced the grant that that allowed me to come over to to establish the department. But there were focus groups and surveys, um, a lot of community engagement, town hall meetings, um, online surveys, phone surveys, uh, um, that sort of thing. And then there were, like, there were stakeholders in the community, from council members to um, small business owners, uh, in those particular neighborhoods to get together in working groups. Um, that's the structure as I, as I, as I know it. Um, yeah. How do you envision the future of this program? How do you imagine it will be? What are the next steps? Um, the next steps, I mean, we're, we're chugging along. I mean, I'd love to see this expanded. It's already expanded to all five boroughs of New York City, and it happened pretty quickly, a lot faster than I thought it would. Um, 
I would like to see this adopted in other cities across the country um, to prevent, I think, the, the adoption of for-profit um, uh, you know, services in, in, uh, that, that, are, that are kind of hungry for this market, I guess. Um, I would love to see more public libraries across the country adopt this, this model and understand it. And it, that, it needs to that understanding needs to happen pretty quickly because, um, again, there are people who are, are being, being charged for the service that are um, being denied access to their loved ones and in-person visitation. So I'd like to see this across the country um, in larger cities. What do you think are the biggest challenges for that to happen? The challenges you have to overcome for that to happen moving forward to other states? Um, what are the biggest biggest challenges are, are really buy-in from from the organizations, right? I mean, it took a while for us to get there in New York City, and we're pretty we're fairly progressive in terms of cities across the country. But um, like, what does this look like in Oklahoma City, right? So if we're in Oklahoma City and we're talking about video visitation for people, um, I guess the challenge for me is like what we talked about before, sort of like the the sinister compromise. I mean, do I pitch Oklahoma City? like video visitation knowing full well that the result will be like that guy will be able to meet with his son like as much as he wants to and and try to in my pitch to Oklahoma City say well you know it's going to save you you money you know um, because you're not going to have to escort people to to the visit you know area I mean that that would be like the biggest personal challenge like trying to to sort of align my pitch for this with priorities that I'm not comfortable with aligning myself to. So, yeah. So when you started this project, the answer was no, and you found a place where you could turn it into a yes. Um, like going from New York Public Library to, is there, what's the sort of next thing that you want to do where right now you're still trying to get buy in for this next idea? Um, I mean, yeah. Don't mean that specifically, but is it no. just extending this program, or do you have like a sort of another element of library service that you to? We've experienced rapid growth. Like it was like three and a half years ago. It was like me in an office, and I was given the space to sort of like put together plans, which is is very rare, by the way. Like we, I had a tremendous amount of support from my organization to do this, to plan everything out. Um, within the last year, um, we've added 14 new staff, full-time staff members in our office. We've had to redesign our entire space in, in the office to accommodate. And all of the big things that I wanted to try, televisit, um, social workers in libraries, legal services in multiple languages in libraries, like those things have come true within the last year. So I'm like nervous about like the rapid growth, quite frankly. Um, the next big thing, like it's like, I think the next big thing is like, how do we as, as a, a library um, respond accordingly to this political environment? You know, how do we flex our values as a library appro in appropriate ways? And I think everything that we're doing in our department kind of does that already, but how can we do it more and how can we get like my colleague who's sitting in Sheepshead Bay, who is fine just punching in and out of work every day, sitting at the reference desk and saying goodbye to people, how do I get him motivated to um, tap into that sort of social justice kind of DNA that he has somewhere inside him? He knows it, he's in a public library. Like, how do I get more of that out of, out of our staff core? On that note, can I ask a general budgeting question? Yeah. You said the needs assessment form the grant that ended up creating the position. Yeah. Is the expansion that you're talking about all on that same grant? Oh no, that grant is like long gone. Um, but we were pretty good at, um, again, building up really good services. And again, like the, the, the part about like being a small group and then influencing a larger system, um, we've, we've received, we've done a lot of good work, I think, and we have a lot of smart people and motivated people and caring people around us and people are paying attention. So it hasn't been, I, I'm sometimes a pessimist, like it's not gonna last, right? I mean, we've had a good run. Um, and we're right now we're trying to kind of position ourselves as essential library services. Like, of course you have video visitation at your library. Of course you, you connect families who are, who are separated by incarceration. Of course you have legal services at your library to help undocumented immigrants you know, navigate the system. Of course you do. And once we get to that point, then, you know, then we can talk about like, you know, what next? Um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see. Is that how you position 
yourself as the we are this pro program that's very successful, or do you position yourself as we are the people who look at what programs we sh should be offering because if we did, they would be really successful? I position this as like how do we remain relevant to our communities in Brooklyn? I mean, we. You know, I asked earlier at the opening, like, what, what do you use the library for, right? Well, people use the library for all sorts of things. We just need to listen to the community and figure out, like, what they're saying. So if we can move the library into more of a sort of like a community-led kind of library, um, uh, yeah. Um, I mean, all the programs that I've been mentioning, I mean, these had a tremendous amount of community input. I mean, it wasn't just us like sitting around in a, in a room just saying, this is this, 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 and this. I mean, we had scrapped a lot of plans because it wasn't going to work out for the communities that we wanted to serve. Um, but I want libraries to take notice that this is kind of the method that you, this is a method for survival. Like, you really meet the acute needs of your communities and you do it well and you're responsive and you can even anticipate after a while like what communities are going to be looking for. Um, it's not easy. I mean, that's, again, we got like 1,200 people working at that library. We have 60 branches. Um, there are a lot of priorities that, 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 that are there. But, yeah. A survey for the who? For who? For the parents that are oh yeah, it's not it's not like a blank thing for the col color like your experience. It actually is a survey about um, um, you know how many are you more inclined to go visit uh, your loved one in person? I mean that's a big one for us. We'd like to measure that. We were talking about measurement before. Like by having more contact, do you want even more contact? You know, that's, uh, that's something that we'd really like to measure. So we ask that question. Um, you know, how, how frequently are you going to be visiting now the library? Are you going to be um, going to any other programs now that you're, that you're, um, you're doing this program? So not just coming into the library to visit with, with dad, but I came into the library the other day just to, to go to like a, a story time with my kid. I'd never been to the library before, so this is great. Um, yeah, we want to figure out sort of like how people are connecting with their community through the library. Uh, there was, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, may I ask you a question? What's your most valuable experience you get from the operating process? Like you said before, how to make a change in their large organization, especially like your, your public service department. Your, Because you will always have some, like your bureaucracy, you either say there are a lot of complaints, and then you either have someone to get a food. Do you have any other experience to share? Of just like getting buy in from, from the organization? Uh, like your, how to get things down in your big organization? Like you get a new idea to uh, ask for it. Doing it. Yeah, I mean, I try to build support where I can find it, and mostly it's coming from the communities that we work in. So if I talk talk about a program, I might have an idea for a video visitation or like lawyers in, in libraries, but I, I start I need to go to the organizations that we're partnering with, um, some of the reentry organizations like the Osborne Association or Fortune Society. Um, if I'm talking about legal services, um, uh, Arab American Association, I need to talk to Make the Road and talk about this sort of with our partners as an idea and then get like that sort of consensus. So when I go to the, the leadership of the library and say we have this plan and we already have all these other folks who are into it and they think that this is a really wonderful way to start expanding this program in these very unique and relevant ways, like you build consensus. So it's not just like one person going into an office you know, throwing down like a stack of papers on somebody's desk and say, I got the, the next idea, you know, but you build like your program and you build your support and you build your community um, to, to sort of have some sort of like critical mass almost like go at these, at these decision makers. Sure, it's, it's probably 
probably gets emotional or something. There are times that things like that happen. Do you have or do you work with counselors for the kids so that the kids to follow up with the kids afterwards or you just assume the parents will yeah, so um, we work with the Osborne Association. So the Osborne Association is um, um, they, they, they're a reentry organization that uh, um, we have a, a bunch of their social work interns who come through and um, meet with us on each visit just to be on hand just in case right, anything, anything happens or if the parent or caregiver needs any support or the children need to have any support. So we're very mindful, mindful of that, definitely, um, you know, for, for these visits, right? That's good. Thank you. Thanks for that. Yeah. I wanted to know if there was a, uh, either a favorite book of yours personally or a book that you really enjoyed that you think informed the work that you're doing. <laughs> That's a great question. Thank you so much for asking uh, about books. Thank you. Uh, I, I, I quoted Angela Davis up here. Um, Pick it up. Are Prisons Obsolete? It came out in 2003. It's very slim. Um, Angela Davis is a prison abolitionist, um, and the first time that I even thought about like w the the concept of I read Michel Foucault and, and whatnot, but like the idea of a prison being like, sort of like this permanent part of our landscape, like Angela Davis challenged that, and it really um, it took a few readings of it, but I really um, I really connected to it. And she even goes, I mean, Angela Davis even goes through some of the, um, the idea about being sort of like a public good, like a, like a library or in like, a, like a school or whatever, operating within a larger system of oppression, right? Which is a very good conversation for me to be a part of, um, operating out of this space. So that, I think, if any, any of the work uh, that you enter into that deals with the criminal justice system needs to go through Angela Davis, I think. Yeah, thank you. That, that, thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Thank you.